One of the highlights of London in the summer is the chance to visit the Globe Theatre, a reconstruction of the place where Shakespeare worked and premiered many of his plays. It's a raucous and interactive take on Shakespeare, which is surprisingly good fun. And like many great writers, Shakespeare had a love of intrigue and murder, at least in his plays. And one of the plot twists that he often uses is poison. Hamlet's dad has it poured into his ear, Romeo drinks it in despair, and Cleopatra kills herself with the bite of a poisonous snake. And the poison is small, but deadly. As Shakespeare puts it, swift as quicksilver it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body, and with sudden vigour doth posset and curd the blood. And that image of a poison that spreads and kills as it does is actually one that the Bible uses to describe sin. It's beautifully put in Deuteronomy 29 as Moses warns the people against turning away from God. Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. And this image of sin as poison is one that I find really helpful for getting my head around why sin matters so much more than we often realise. This film is part of a series reflecting on the theme of judgment. It's a theme that comes up a lot in the Bible, but which most of us tend to shy away from and actually really struggle with. And one reason why we struggle with the idea of judgment is because most of us just don't get why sin is such a big deal. We know we're not perfect, but most of the things that we do wrong just don't seem that big a deal to us. And so when we read about the punishments and judgments in the Bible, it all seems just a bit much. Why can't God forgive us or just let it go? This image of poison is one that gives us an answer to that question. Because poison isn't something you can ignore or just let go. However small and insignificant it may seem at first, if left unchecked, it grows and spreads until it kills us. And what Moses is saying in this verse is that's basically what sin is like. It may seem small and insignificant to us, but if left unchecked, it grows and spreads until it destroys us. And actually worse, because it doesn't just destroy us, it also impacts and destroys those around us. And we can see that in all kinds of little ways every day. Think of the cross word that escalates into an argument and ends up in the breakdown of friendships and relationships. Or the little white lie that gets out of control until it hurts those we love. Or that moment of carelessness that causes an injury to someone else. And actually the Bible is clear that it's not just in those small scale details that sin acts like poison. It's also true on the much larger scale as well. There's one book of the Bible that illustrates this particularly well. It's the book of Judges. It's quite an ambiguous book. It's best known for the stories of well-known heroes or judges who rescue the people of Israel from a succession of enemies and disasters. But alongside that good news is a general picture of growing sin, spiraling down out of control and worsening with each successive generation. At one point, the writer comments, when each judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than their ancestors. Following other gods, they refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. And the root of the problem is highlighted as something that we might view as relatively minor. The people's decision to ignore God and follow their own ideas about life. The verdict of the whole book is really summed up in its final words. Everyone did as they saw fit, or literally 
what was right in their own eyes. It's actually the same problem, turning away from God and following our own ideas, that Moses highlights as a bitter poison in that verse from Deuteronomy that we looked at earlier. It's not something that we tend to view as that big a deal. In fact, most people today would probably see it as a positive. After all, how often are we told, be true to yourself? What makes the comments in the book of Judges so punchy though, is that the writer then sketches out what happens when we stop paying any attention to God. And the book finishes with two long stories which are supposed to sum up just how bad things had become. And I find the final one particularly shocking and difficult to read. They start slowly in chapter 19 with a broken romance and a few little issues that suggest something's wrong, but not a lot more. And yet then it flares up horribly with a gang rape, murder and cover up. And that in turn then escalates into a civil war in which 25,000 people are killed. And then just when you thought the whole sorry tale was over, we discover that the leaders of the nation plotted to kidnap 400 young women and force them into marriage with some of their former enemies. It's an awful story. And so when the writer then sums up the whole situation by explaining that in those days, everyone did as they saw fit, there can be no doubt that that is not meant to be a good thing. Now, thankfully, our society isn't as bad as that. In fact, that story reminds me of how good we have it. There's so much in my life, this country, and in living today that is really fantastic. And we have plenty to be thankful for. I think of my friends and my family, of my job, of my health, of where I live, or more general things like the privilege of living in a free and democratic country, and lots more. For me, it really is a long list of blessings. And I talk about being thankful and blessings because actually the Bible tells us that ultimately all those good things come from God. He's the source of everything great about life. As Paul puts it, he has richly provided us with all things to enjoy. And God wants us to enjoy life, to flourish, to live life to the full. And that, that's something that everybody can experience. That's uh, not just blessings for Christians. And there's lots of wonderful people who I know who don't follow Jesus. And yet, whether we recognize it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, God is the source of everything good in life. As the Apostle James puts it, every good and perfect gift is from above. God is the source of every blessing, every good thing, every laugh and every smile. And yet what that also means is that to turn away from God is actually to turn away from the source of everything good in life. At first, that may not seem like that big a deal. We still get to enjoy all those blessings, the smiles and laughter continue just without God. What's wrong with that? Well, the problem is that however small that sin may seem at first, it's never the end. And sin is a poison. And it may start small, it may be slow acting, we may not even notice it at first, but slowly and surely, it grows and spreads and destroys. And despite all the blessings that we see around us, we all experience that in our own lives, of a world that is broken and out of sync. And if we're honest, that's not just true out there, it's also true in here, in us. There's an old sermon illustration that I love. Imagine that I got hold of a film of key moments in your life, except this film isn't the highlights, it's the lowlights. All your worst moments, all your worst actions, all your worst thoughts. What would you do to stop me from posting that film on YouTube? In my case, the answer is almost anything because I know that there's so much that is wrong and broken in my life. And the Bible tells me that the root and the foundation of that wrongness and brokenness is my sin. 
And then when I look at the world around me, the root and the foundation of all that is wrong and broken and all the sin and the suffering in the world that we see, again, is sin. I understand why Moses says that sin is such a bitter poison. Why the Bible makes such a big deal of sin. And I ask, what's God going to do about it? And I no longer want the answer to be nothing. Because I want a world in which all that junk is got rid of. A place in which there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain. A time when sin and suffering are just a distant memory. This building behind me is St Bart's Hospital. And it's one of the oldest and best hospitals in Britain. And it also happens to be just across the road from our church. And one of the things that Bart's is famous for is its world-leading cancer centre. Most of the treatments that you'll find them using in there and which are used to treat cancer are actually fairly severe and painful. Things like surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy. And there are usually significant side effects. So why do we use them? Well, of course, the answer is obvious because we want to cure or at least slow the progress of the cancer. And cancer is so serious that we're willing to endure almost anything if it will affect a cure. And I think in some ways, judgment is like that, a cure for cancer. It's serious, it's painful, it's severe, but it is also necessary because judgment is the only answer, the only cure for the poison of our sin. In the Bible, that judgment takes various forms. And we need to be honest that many of those forms are hard and difficult to read. Perhaps most obviously when we look at final judgment. On one level, final judgment is the moment when all that is wrong in the world will be destroyed and everything put right. But it is also a moment when some people will find themselves on the wrong side of God's judgment eternally with all the pain and anguish and horror that that implies. And yet, that is not the Bible's last word. Final judgment comes in Revelation 20, but the story continues in Revelation 21 and 22 with salvation and a vision of paradise. And in those chapters, there is an invitation to all of us now. Let anyone who wants take of the free gift of the water of life. And that is made possible because of what in many ways is the most important moment of judgment in the whole Bible, the cross. And people often say that the cross is the ultimate expression of God's love, and it is. But it is also the ultimate expression of God's judgment. Because at the cross, Jesus takes upon himself all of our sin, all that is wrong and broken and twisted and poisoned in me is put on him, is judged in him. As he dies, it dies. In fact, the picture is even stronger than that. As Jesus dies, I die. Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We die with Jesus, and all that is wrong in us dies with him. But then we also rise again with him, and we experience new life in him, but now free from the poison of sin. I don't completely understand how that is possible, and the fullness of it is yet to come. There's a future element to our salvation. When Jesus returns and the dead are raised, then we will experience everything that Jesus has won for us on the cross. We will be changed and made perfect at last. And that's really what the cross is all about judging all that is wrong and broken in us, destroying it, pulling out the poison, and yet not destroying us, but saving us. It's the cure for cancer that destroys the cancer 
but lets the person live, cured and free at last. And it's a cure that brings with it a promise not just for me, but for the world. The hope of a world in which there will no longer be the brokenness and poison of sin. A world in which there is truly no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away.